Okay, now we're ready to do some definite integrals. In other words, find the area under a curve. Now the key thing that we're going to be using here is the fundamental theorem of calculus, which I just showed you. Uh, maybe I'd better write properly here. So the fundamental theorem of calculus was this. So it said that if we take the integral from a to b, now those are your lower bound and your upper bound of some function f of x dx, it's going to be just your antiderivative, which you write with a capital F. We're going to evaluate at b and minus the antiderivative evaluated at a. So that's how we do this. This is going to be what we're going to use. So I like this. Now we can do some practical stuff here. So take a look at this. This is actually pretty cool. So we can now find the area under the curve y equals x squared. Now if we want to try to actually draw that, we could. Because we know what x squared looks like. It's a function that goes like this. You know, something like that. So from x equals 0 to x equals 3, let's say this is magically, let's say that's 3, then it would be this area right here. Now it may look sort of like a triangle, but it's not exactly because it's curvy. So what I love about this, I think this is so awesome, that you can actually find the exact value for the area under this curvy curve here by using this fundamental theorem of calculus. I think that is so cool. So let's actually deal with it. So how do we do this? Well, step one, let's say we want to do the integral from zero to three, right? That was my lower bound and upper bound of x squared dx. I think it helps to write the proper notation. So again, this means take the area under the curve from zero to three of this function or this equation x squared with respect to x because in case it was a multivariable equation, and that's just, this just helps us. So what would that be? Well, I need to find the antiderivative. Now what's the antiderivative of x squared? We've learned this before. It's you just have to take one more power. So because it was an x to the power of two, it becomes x to the power of three over three. Now, what we have to do now is evaluate this. So what we normally do, I and mean, we have to evaluate this from zero to three. So what we often do is write a little line like this and say zero to three. This sort of just gives us a little hint. So there's the, there's the antiderivative in general. We're going to sort of evaluate it you know, from three and zero here. So what we're gonna do then is this here. So we're gonna do the antiderivative at B. So I'll do that one first. So at B, well, this is B here, it's three. So it'll be three cubed over three. See, wherever I see an X, I replace it with this value. So three cubed over three. And I'm going to then subtract from it the antiderivative at a. Well, this is the antiderivative, and a is 0. So it'll be 0 cubed over 3. This is going to be the answer. Well, I need to know what 3 cubed is. That's 3 times 3, which is 9, times 3, which is 27. So it's 27 over 3 uh, minus, well, 0 cubed is 0. 0 divided by 3 is still 0. Well, that's nice. That means minus 0. That doesn't do anything. And then I just have to say, well, what's 27 divided by 3? Well, that's 9. So this right here would be the answer. It's just 9. It's exactly 9. Isn't that cool? So the area under this curve from 0 to 3 is precisely 9. Not 9 point something. It's exactly this. I think that's really neat. So let's uh, maybe use our calculator to double check this. Because your calculator, if you have a TI calculator, uh, lots of the other ones can do this as well. I'm going to attempt to just do this integral here. So I'm going to try to actually graph. The idea is going to be to graph x squared, and I'm going to find the area from 0 to 3 here. So let's do that. I'm going to say here y equals x squared. I'm going to say graph. So there it is. There's my graph. Whoops. Maybe I should do a nice uh, zoom here. I'll do zoom standard just to get me a nice looking graph here. There we go. Just a matter of changing the window from what I had before. So here we go, and I want to find the area from 0 to 3. So I want this area right here shaded. Your calculator can do that. I could do this little blue calc here. So second, there we go. And you see this one here, this integral of f of x dx. That's the one I want. So I want number 7. So I press 7. It says lower limit, question mark. That's 0. So I just type in 0, enter. Upper limit is 3. Watch this, it's going to shade it. Super awesome. 
So there we go, it tells me the integral of f of x dx is 9. Hey, look at that. So that I think is pretty cool. Once you know how to do this, I think it's really neat. You can do some very, very powerful stuff. You can find areas under a curve. Uh, let's do it again with another one. This time it may look more complicated. So this time we want to find the area under the curve of f of x equals 3 sine x from x equals 0 to x equals pi over 2. Well, I always like to draw these, so um, hopefully you remember how a curve of sine x looks like. Sine x always starts here, goes up, goes down, goes back, and it has a period of, well this is 2 pi, that means halfway through that's pi, that means over here that's um, pi over 2, because that's half of that, and then if I count 1 pi over 2, 2 pi over 2, that means this is 3 pi over 2. Just to show you the different values here for one period of it. Of course it keeps going forever, right? It goes like this, goes like this. Now the top and the bottom here, I've done a transformation. So this isn't just sine x, it's 3 sine x. What that 3 means is that instead of going up and down by 1, it goes up and down by 3. So this is 3 and negative 3. This is a nice sketch of this. Now I want to find the area from 0 to pi over 2. So what I'm really trying to find then is from 0 to pi over 2, I want to know what's, what's this area right here. That's what I'm really trying to find here. That's what I want. Again, I can use the fundamental theorem of calculus to do this. Because the idea then is going to be, oops, it's difficult to color like this. I guess it's the reason I'm not an artist. But, um, okay, so the idea then is to do the same thing. We're going to use the fundamental theorem of calculus, which is to say, if I know the bounds, which I do, I just take the antiderivative and evaluate it at the upper bound, subtract from that the antiderivative at the lower bound. So we need to find the antiderivative of sine. And the antiderivative of sine is negative cosine. So I'm going to actually write that down. So I want to do the integral from 0 to pi over 2, that's my lower and upper bounds, of 3 sine x dx. This is sort of how we write the full-on thing here. So that's going to be what? Well, it's going to be equal to the antiderivative, in other words, um, well, the antiderivative of 3 sine x is going to be negative 3 cos x. Now, how did I know that? Well, the antiderivative of sine is just negative cos, and then there's just a 3 hanging out, so it just still has to hang out. I have to evaluate this from 0 to pi over 2. What that really means I have to do then is I have to evaluate some minus 3 times cos of pi over 2. I'll do that first. Minus 3 cos of pi over 2. And I subtract from that minus 3 cos of 0. Okay, let's do it like this. So that's really what I have to do. Um, actually, maybe I'll just put it in like a little sort of square bracket here, just so I know that I have to deal with that and I have to deal with that. So it's sort of like this thing minus this thing. And be very careful with your negatives and things like that. That's what can cause students problems. So let's deal with it. Well, we have to know what cosine of pi over two is. Now I've drawn a graph of, of sine. Maybe it helps to draw what the graph of cosine looks like. By the way, this was a graph here of y equals 3 sine x. What does a graph of just cosine x look like? Well, cosine x, it starts off at uh, here, and then it goes like this. That's what the first period. Of course, this is 2 pi. I mean, this here is pi, and that right there is pi over 2. This is 1, and that's negative 1. So I want cosine of pi over 2. Cosine of pi over 2 is whatever this x value, that's pi over 2. And the height of the graph is actually 0. So I know then that this becomes, well, cosine of pi over 2 is actually 0. So minus 3 times 0 is what I get. Well, that's easy. It just cancels out. Here I have minus minus. That becomes a plus 3 times. And what's the cosine of 0? Cosine of 0 is 1. So I can say 3 times 1. Well, that means it's just 0 plus 3 times 1, so that's just 3. That's it. I'm done. So the area under the curve is going to be just 3. By the way, it's perfectly allowed, though, to get that your area is a fraction. It can be all sorts of weird things. It can be things with square roots, whatever. I happen to give you examples that worked out really nicely, but it's very often a fraction. So don't let that throw you off. Maybe let's check that with our trusty old calculator here. So what I'm going to do is go back to y equals. I'm going to clear that. 
and I'm going to clear the key history. Now I want to do a graph and I want to do it uh, from 0 to pi over 2. And I want to do the graph of the original function which is 3 sine x. So I want 3 sine x. That's really important before I do this to change my mode. I want to change my mode, so I press mode here. I go down to radians, press enter. The reason is that I would like to do my graph using things with pi's. So that means I have to be in radian mode. So I'm going to, well, first of all, maybe let's try to look at this graph. So I'll do uh, zoom trig. I like to do that one. That gets me the graph with sort of trigonometric zoom here. I think it goes from like 2 pi. Yeah, if you look at this, we've gone one whole period. If we do a window, we can do that's what roughly 2 pi is. It's actually supposed to be negative 6.28, but close enough. So this at least is a nice looking graph. Here we go. That's, that's the graph of 3 sine x. See, it goes up to 3. So actually, my graph here is pretty accurate. Right, that's the first period right here, at least. It looks pretty good. I wanted this area from here to here. So again, I'm going to calc. See a little blue on there? So second. And I'm going to do the integral here, so number 7. And lower limit. Well, I wanted it from x equals 0. It didn't have to be 0. It could have been anything. But I just happened to pick x equals 0 here. And the upper limit's going to be, I can actually type in pi over 2. So see this little pi right here? So second, there we go, that's pi over 2. I press enter. It's hopefully going to shade it, and it tells me the integral is 3. In other words, the area under this curve is equal to 3. Awesome! So that's how we can deal with these. We can deal with all sorts of really crazy looking questions and find areas under curves by just using the fundamental theorem of calculus. And after you've done it a bunch of times, maybe you'll see it is somewhat fun, because at least you can find the area underneath a curvy curve. So it could be whatever weird shape you want. You find the exact value. And again, this uses this principle or this property that you take an infinite number of infinitely small little rectangles. That's essentially what we're doing here. So I haven't shown you sort of the... I've been missing some steps to show you this, but that's okay. I think it's it suffices to show you, well, first of all, is you have to find antiderivative and then away you go. But this is basically doing this. So if you, I took an infinite number of an infinitely small little rectangles, then the values would converge to 9. So they would get really, really close to a value of 9. Why do they get really close to it? Because that's the actual answer. See, as I add more and more little rectangles, I get closer and closer to 9. So if I had an infinite number of them, then I'd have exactly 9. So this is the precise answer for the area under this curvy thing. Just like this one right here was the precise answer. That's three. That's the area underneath this curvy thing. So that's how we can work with what we call definite integrals. Definite because we have bounds. We know where we start. We know where we finish. Isn't that cool?